Greetings all, Ferrariman601 here. Welcome back to another 118th scale model car review of this, the 2019 Ferrari SF90 Formula One car, brought to us in 118th scale by BBR. This one is the third BBR model that I've had in the collection, and it is also the third BBR Ferrari Formula One car in the collection. I have been absolutely impressed by BBR and what they do with these Formula One cars. My first one was the Ferrari SF70H of 2017. I followed that up last year with the SF71H of 2018. And now the third time is really the charm, in my opinion, with this SF90 from the 2019 championship. The amount of detail on this model and just the overall quality of its general workmanship, it's absolutely phenomenal. I really, really like these BBRs, and I really, really like this one in particular. It's a little bit of a departure from Ferrari's design, and particularly their livery design, because it features a matte paint finish rather than a high-gloss one that we typically see on most cars, race cars included, but it looks really nice, and BBR have rendered it very, very nicely as well, I've got to say. In terms of the car's real-world analog, the Ferrari SF90, it was the Formula One car with which Ferrari competed in the 2019 FIA Formula One World Championship. It was driven by Sebastian Vettel and debutant Ferrari driver Charles Leclerc coming over over from Alfa Romeo after the 28th season, his first year in Formula One. Charles Leclerc absolutely set the world alight with this car. He really has become the gravitas that Ferrari have needed from a driver. He's officially a number two driver still, even in 2020, but his performances have been absolute legendary stuff so far. His two highlights of the 2019 season were his wins at the Belgian Grand Prix and the Italian Grand Prix, two absolute classic events and two amazing venues with which a driver can really gain a lot of political capital, particularly when he takes his first two Formula One victories for Ferrari at those two venues, which happened to occur at consecutive race meetings. So Charles Leclerc became Ferrari's darling in 2019, and his performances were so dominant, particularly at a very difficult Belgian Grand Prix weekend, which had been marred by the death of Antoine Hubert, who was a Formula Two driver who was killed in a Formula Two race there on the Saturday. The race happened one day later, Charles Leclerc, who was not a countryman but a close friend of Antoine Hubert, Charles Leclerc, of course, being from Monaco, and Hubert was French, but he took his maiden Formula One victory and he dedicated it to the honor of his fallen friend. And that moment meant that when this car came along, I had to get it. Charles Leclerc impressed me as he impressed a lot of people. He backed it up the following outing in Monza at the Italian Grand Prix, winning that race, holding off a late charging Lewis Hamilton. So there it was. The deal was sealed for me. I had to have this model when it came out. It has come out, and now we're reviewing it. Let's take a closer look. The Ferrari SF90, it is, of course, the car with which Ferrari competed in the 2019 Formula One World Championship. Immediately, its predecessor was the SF71H of 2019, and it has been succeeded in 2020 by the SF1000. The car, though, it does demonstrate an evolution of the overall design philosophy that Ferrari has been employing since the 2017 season with the introduction of the current aerodynamic regulations. And, of course, the 2017 car was the SF70H, which we've also taken a look at on the channel about two years ago now. Additionally, we have taken a look at the SF71 on the channel as well. Both of those models are BBRs as well as is this one. So now we have got three BBR Ferraris on the channel and uh, yes, they're all absolutely fantastic. But about the actual car, it is the SF90 and it is a break in Ferrari's kind of conventional but still kind of not conventional naming convention in big air quotes that they have had going on since basically the 2014 season with the uh, SF14T or was it just the F14T? Not entirely sure about that but we had the SF15, we had the SF16 and then we had the SF70, SF71 and then SF90. What's going on here? The car takes its name 90 from 2019 being the 90th anniversary of the formation of Scuderia Ferrari, not the company as we now see it as being a manufacturer. Scuderia Ferrari was of course founded by Enzo Ferrari, that's Mr. Ferrari, 
back in 1929, and it became the official racing division of Alfa Romeo. So 1929 to 2019, that equals 90. So that's where the car gets its name from, breaking from the SF70 and 71 of 2017 and 2018. And of course, the SF1000 for 2020, that further breaks the naming convention again, because Ferrari obviously anticipate to start their 1000th Formula One Grand Prix in 2020. So that's what they're commemorating with the name of the current car. However, back to 2019. The SF90, it is a logical evolution of the design convention that started in 2017 with the SF70, but we have got, of course, evolution because Formula One cars are only current for one day as things stand generally, because at the end of the day, they're prototypes and Formula One, but basically all forms of racing, they really are just big test sessions to figure out what can actually be done with automotive technology. So this version of the SF90 represents the car as it would have appeared at the 2019 Australian Grand Prix, which of course was the season opener, which means that some details on the car are not entirely representative of what the SF90 looked like by the end of 2019. However, it is representative of what the car appeared as in Australia being as it may. What do we have, technically speaking, on this car? Well, of course, it is designed and manufactured by Ferrari for the sole purpose of competing in the 2019 Formula One World Championship. It was designed in part by Mattia Binotto, who is the technical director turned team principal of Ferrari, Enrico Cardile, the head of chassis design, Fabio Montecchi, the deputy chief designer, and David Sanchez, who is the chief aerodynamicist for Ferrari in 2019. We mentioned its predecessors and successors at this point. The technical specifications on the SF90. The front suspension, we have got a push rod double wishbone arrangement there, as we'll be able to see more closely in a few moments' time. The rear suspension, though, pull rod, and that is a convention that's been going on in Formula One since really the end of the V8 era in uh, 2013, but uh, going back to 2009 even, pull rod rear suspension starting to be experimented with as the rear zone on these cars started to become more and more technically critical in terms of aerodynamic performance and the pull rod geometry just allows to have a bit more efficient airflow through the rear zone of the car. Overall length on the SF90 is 5,712 millimeters or 224.9 inches. The width is 2,000 millimeters exactly or 79 inches. That is homologated in the technical regulations from the maximum track that is the axle width on the car. The height 950 millimeters or 37 inches, the wheelbase 3,652 millimeters or 143.8 inches. Notice that the overall length of the car is significantly longer than the wheelbase and that's to account for the nose cone and the rear wing and crash structure and all of those other ancillary components there making up the bodywork and aerodynamic parts of the car. The engine in the SF90, this is a homologated spec in terms of engine specification per the technical regulations for Formula One. It was the Ferrari Type 064. It's a 1.6 liter turbocharged V6 engine, 90 degree bank angle on that engine, displacing 1.6 liters per the regulations there, turbocharged to the tune of one turbocharger, 15,000 RPM is the rev limit per the regulations. However, in practice, we hardly ever see them actually hitting 15,000 RPM due to fuel flow restrictions that start to come in above 10,000 RPM. So for the most part, we'll see these engines revving to between 10,000 and 12,000 RPM, occasionally a little bit higher, but for the most part, no, simply because of what the technical regulations demand. The engine is also supplemented by a hybrid powertrain. We have got a kinetic energy recovery system, which is split into two principal components. We have a motor generator unit kinetic, or an MGUK, which is analogous to the older KERS that Formula One used to run from 2009 through 2013. That's an, an electric motor, really, but doubles as a generator, running off of the rear axle to harvest kinetic energy that otherwise would be lost under braking turns that into electrical energy, sends it into a battery where it can later be deployed back through that same motor generator unit on the rear axle. There's a second MGU, that is the motor generator unit heat, which is run off of the single turbocharger, which is also supplementing the engine. That is a shaft running off of the turbocharger, spinning another motor generator unit to send some of that kinetic energy, which um, really they're talking about heat energy there in the turbocharger, but it's still kinetic energy really because it's taking the rotational momentum of the turbocharger, sending some of that energy through an electric motor slash generator, sending it to the battery store, where it can then be discharged back through the turbocharger to spool it up 
give the engine a little bit better throttle response, effectively negating turbo lag, as well as allowing some energy harvesting to happen at full throttle where the energy would otherwise be deployed. In other words, depleting the energy, you'd be able to recharge some from the MGUH even at full throttle, full rev. So interesting technology there, and all the Formula One cars are running that to some degree or another in terms of what they actually do to manage it. The specifications, though, in terms of energy density and deployment limits, that is all specified and homologated in the regulations. The transmission in the car, that is an 8-speed plus reverse semi-automatic sequential paddle actuated on the steering wheel, of course. All the Formula 1 cars running an 8-speed unit in these days. You're no longer allowed to have fewer gears than the maximum of 8 plus reverse, of course, which has to be fitted to all cars. Overall weight on this car, 743 kilograms, that's 1,638 pounds. Of course, in race trim, with a full tank of fuel, they would be significantly heavier than that because they've got to be carrying around 180, 190 liters of fuel on board. So formula weight in terms of the race start, definitely upwards of 900 kilograms. So lots of fuel on board, and it does really impact the performance, particularly in the first opening moments of a race. That fuel provided, though, by Shell in their V-Power line, as has been the case for all the Ferrari Formula 1 cars going back now 25 years or so. Lubricants also provided by Shell via their Helix Ultra branding. The brakes are carbon-carbon discs on all four wheels. They are by Brembo, and of course they have got multi-piston calipers. I think the front calipers on a Formula One brake system nowadays have six or eight pistons in them. It's ridiculous technology, but carbon-carbon brakes, carbon pads, meaning that they don't do anything until they're glowing red hot, and they stop this car from top speed to zero in, uh, let's say, three seconds to bleed off 200 miles an hour. It's pretty ridiculous, the braking performance in modern Formula One. The tires on this car, as were the same on all of the Formula One cars for 2019, by Pirelli, the Cinturato compounds for the wet weather conditions that we don't see here, but we have the P0 compounds for the dry running, and of course those are slicks. The wheels on the car are the OZ Magnesium wheels. They're 13 inches front and rear, although the rear wheels are wider than the fronts because the rear tires are a lot wider than the fronts. Competition history on the car, not so great by Ferrari's standards, but not the worst car ever. Of course, only entered by Ferrari in 2019. It was driven for the balance of the season by Sebastian Vettel and Charles Leclerc. The car made its debut at the 2019 Australian Grand Prix, which is the specification that we see here. The car took its first win at the 2019 Belgian Grand Prix, big asterisk there, and its last win was the 2019 Singapore Grand Prix, and its last entry was the 2019 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. Formula One cars doing multiple seasons, not something that we typically see these days, although 2020 to 2021, we are going to be seeing that for the most part, if not entirely up and down the grid between 2020 and 2021 due to the happenings in the world. Therefore, the overall competition history on the SF90, it entered 21 races, it took three victories officially, it took a further 19 podium positions, took nine pole positions, and six fastest laps. However, it was not enough to win the world championship for drivers or constructors as Mercedes and Lewis Hamilton have had pretty much a monopoly on that going back to the start of the turbo hybrid era. Lewis Hamilton winning every season of the drivers championship since 2014 with the exception of 2016 when it went to his then teammate Nico Rosberg, but Mercedes still far and away the winners of the constructors championships for the entire second half of the 2010s decade. As we have the car rotating once again, we can start to take a closer look at some of the specific features on this model. I have to say, and I've mentioned this already in this video, that this is the third BBR model that I have in the collection, and it's the third BBR Ferrari Formula One car that I've got in the collection. And every single one of them, going back to the 2017 SF70H, they are incredibly well done. These are some of the best 118th scale Formula One models that you can get today and they are on the level of I would say approaching amalgam in terms of the sort of detail that you get and it's even more impressive when you consider that an amalgam model, an amalgam 118th scale model of a modern Formula One car, in fact you can get an SF90 by amalgam, they're asking $800 US for those models, that's including the taxes and fees. So for $800, you can get an amalgam version of this car, or for about $300, you can get the BBR version of this car. 
And to be entirely honest, although I've never had an amalgam model, and I doubt I ever will because they're inordinately expensive for what they are, this car has all of the same features as the amalgam version, which costs three times as much, basically. So, you be the judge on that, but in my mind, BBR, they have been making the best contemporary Formula One models for the last few years, and going back to the SF70H, if you want to take a look at that video that I did a couple of years ago, I was just as impressed by that one as I am currently by this one. Absolutely incredible workmanship, incredible attention to detail by BBR. We'll zoom in a little bit more and we can start to get a look at some more of the smaller details on the car as it spins past. There's the rear zone going by. That looks really nice. And of course, along the uh, flanks of the car, along the, the uh, front section, you can see the barge boards, the turning vanes, the radiator inlets, and then of course the big old front wing comes in there. It looks absolutely tremendous. Also, what is very nice on this car, and it was new for Ferrari in 2019, it's the paint on this. Ferrari, they went for the matte paint finish, taking away the high gloss paint finishes that they've been running basically since forever, and they go for this this matte finish, and they said that it was for the purpose of weight savings. Does it really save much weight? Ah, probably not. We're probably only talking about a couple of grams here and there, but that's why Ferrari decided to go away from the high gloss, and BBR have absolutely nailed it with their paint finish on this car. I have got a pretty bright spotlight shining directly on the car right now, and you can't really see too many really stark reflections. All of the light coming back into the camera is very diffuse, and that is indicative, of course, of the surface characteristics of this paint. It is phenomenally well done. A lot of people thought that the matte paint finish looked a little underwhelming on television, but I've got to say that uh, this model actually having it as a physical object in my hand it really looks very, very nice. Sometimes when you have models with high gloss paint finishes, I think they, they look a little bit distorted in photographs simply because it is so highly reflective and if you happen to be shooting with a spotlight like I'm doing now or if you're taking stills with a flash, sometimes it just shines directly back into the camera lens and it spoils the image. But this, everything is very muted and, and diffuse and it just really looks very, very nice as you can see. I think it makes the decal stand out a little bit more and it's just a little bit easier on the eyes as well. And when we uh, go freehand later on, and you'll see all of the uh, very tight and close-up details with bolt holes and things like that, I, I think they really pop out better with this paint finish. So I've got to say, BBR did an absolutely tremendous job on the paint. Also, what they've done a tremendous job with, and again, we'll have a closer look at these later on, the tires look absolutely tremendous. We have got sidewall lettering that's actually embossed into the tire as part of the mold. They look absolutely resplendent. Maybe you can start to get a sense of what they look like here, but um, again, we'll have to get in a lot more closely later on to show you that properly. But just amazing, amazing detail that they have done inside and out on this car. Cockpit detail is tremendous, and just overall, the overall plan of the car aerodynamically, there's the front wing with all of the stays and flap adjusters and things like that. It looks absolutely tremendous. It really, really does. The rear wing end fences there with all of the strakes and gills coming down, they're all individually modeled. There are no stickers trying to create illusions there. That's all actually modeled there in the plastic. It looks absolutely tremendous, and basically it looks entirely correct for the Australia spec of the car, which this model is designed to represent. So again, hats off once more to BBR for making a tremendous model. It has a great visual impact, and again, it's, uh, it's one of the nicer ones that I have got so far in the collection. Let's stop the rotation and take a closer look at the front wing. We'll bring the camera down a little bit just to get a little bit more on eye level with the front wing. There it is. First of all, you can see the nose cone and nose tip of the car. Basically the same design that they've been running since 2016 with that low wide nose tapering to a very abrupt and narrow tip. That's to appease the regulations there. But we've got these two nostril sections on either side of the nose tip. That's to start to get air funneled through the underside of the car where it can then be worked by the barge boards on the uh, forward edge of the monocoque. But that uh, looks absolutely fine. I love that. And of course we've got great decal work going on with 
the uh, little flourish of the uh, colors of Italy, the Ferrari logo, and then all of their sponsorship stuff going forward uh, there. But here is our front wing detail. Of course, we have got our neutral center section, which is homologated in the regulations. You're not allowed to do anything there 300 millimeters laterally. But once you get beyond that point, you can start to play. And the aerodynamicist absolutely had a field day with these front wings. They were knocked down a lot for 2019, trying to cut back on cascades and other things that the teams would have in this area of the wing, just trying to create more outwash to get the air funneled around the big front tires here, which create a lot of drag via turbulence. That was knocked down for 2019. However, the aerodynamicists, they never stopped trying to innovate, and they continue to innovate constantly. So we have got our principal flap sections and are basically only flap sections on this wing. Counting the uh, main plane, the lowest level of it, we've got one, two, three, four, five flap elements there. If we get some more direct lighting on it, you can start to see these uh, brake lines there, mold lines in the wing. It looks fine. The uh, wing, in terms of being modeled, it's modeled in plastic. As you can see, it's pretty thin plastic. It's uh, very easily flexible there if I put a little bit of pressure on it. But it is not separate elements in here. All of the little ridges you can see, that's just done with tricks of detailing in terms of having a little carbon look in the little shut lines there where the slot gaps would actually be on the real wing, but it is just one single molded piece for the model. In actuality, of course, you would have slot gaps and then all of these flaps would be individual sections in reality, thus necessitating these little braces, little stays, these metallic stays here, just to add some more rigidity to the wing so it just doesn't start flopping around and vibrating like crazy as each flap element puts some aerodynamic interference in front of the other. Additionally, on the front wing, you can see right here, it's in carbon against a carbon backdrop, so it's a little bit hard to see, but right here is a flap adjuster, and you can start to see that better with my finger behind it. That's a flap adjuster. It has a little aerodynamic shape to it as well. It has an airfoil shape. So again, just by even leaving a flap adjuster in a given position, you can get a little bit more entrainment of the air. So again, these guys are never stopping in their attempt to get more aero efficiency and more bang for their buck in terms of downforce over drag. Looks absolutely tremendous. And of course, on the left side of the wing, screen right for us, it looks exactly the same, but as a mirror image, looks very, very nice. Additionally, on the front end, you can see brake duct detail in here. There you go. You can see that we have got some veins inside the brake ducts. Looks like there are three of them. They look marvelous, as does the one on the right-hand side. Of course, a mirror image of the left. Looks fantastic. I like just how fine and thin the uh, little veins in there are. And you can see that it is all in three dimensions. Those are actual plastic bits there for the veins inside the brake ducts. And you can see behind them deeper into the duct assembly. Looks really, really nice. Obviously, you can also see the front suspension here. We have got wishbone, wishbone, push rod. So double wishbone, push rod, front suspension on the SF90, as we said already. And of course, it looks the part, the suspension uprights and the wishbones are done in a carbon fiber look. So you can see that looks very, very cool. And also we're a little bit low on this angle, but Ferrari taking a page out of the Williams handbook from decades ago, you can see up here on the wishbones, we have got branding. There's Lenovo branding on top of the wishbones there, the forward upper wishbone. So looks really, really nice. And of course, BBR doing a tremendous job with all of this. Along the right-hand side of the car now, we'll start to zoom in. Take a look toward the front end. There you go, there's our front wing end fence. Also new for 2019 was the reprofiling of these end fences. We used to have several little veins and ducts and strikes along the uh, outside surface of the end fences. This is just all smooth now. It's a slightly curving profile from fore to aft, but it's all smooth, no multiple elements there, just a little vortex generator underneath there, the extreme bottom edge of the wing. But very smooth, but it is still slightly curved, so you do get a little bit of outwash around the front end, but all of that is well and good and indicative of what the teams actually did. Here's our front wheel and tire assembly on SF90. Looks absolutely wonderful, as we can see. And right there, you can start to see with the way that I've got the light shining on it right now, you can see that we have got lettering embossed on the tire sidewall, just beyond the bead of where the rim joins up with the tire. 
looks absolutely tremendous and it's legible up toward the upper right you can see Pirelli made in Italy and then across the bottom upside down from our perspective right now it says tire for competition use only so entirely legible there and it's legible by eye too it's very small obviously but it is legible but uh, the camera have helping us a little bit there in terms of being able to read it more easily but it looks absolutely wonderful as I move the light around some more you can see some more detail on that lettering it looks marvelous also inside you can see that we've got our wheel we've got a blue wheel nut here on the right hand side of the car that's indicative of the, of the uh, thread direction and then of course we've got the OZ branding inside the wheel itself behind that we've got brake and caliper detail a little bit hard to see but it's there looks marvelous Moving rearward a little bit, there is our primary barge board area on SF90. Have a look at just how complex all of these things are. Barge boards, of course, very important in the front end aerodynamic characteristics of a Formula One car these days. And you can see what they've got going on here. All sorts of different elements. We've got vertical, horizontal, we've got some sideways and upside down and backwards. Not really, but yeah, we've got all kinds of things going on here. Each one of these little elements placed just so they will start to generate vortices and steer the air where the aerodynamicists want it to go. Looks absolutely marvelous. We also have a couple of metallic areas here. There's one just behind these uh, upright sections here. It's a little bit hard to see. Perhaps you can see it there. And then there's obviously a more uh, conspicuous one right here. Another metallic one, which actually I believe has a structural purpose on the model as well, just bracing that barge board assembly because it's not really secured with very much, I've got to say. But there it is. Moving outboard, we've got the leading edge of the turning vane, which is over the side pod. Looks very nice. And then, of course, in the midst of all of this, we've got our leading edge of the floor. Looks absolutely tremendous. The turning vane proper, this links up with the side of the monocoque around the radiator inlet. Then we go down, and it links up to the floor right there where the reference plane comes in. Looks good. And then, moving up, you can see that we have got our wing mirror right here. This is braced to the side of the cockpit, and then it comes outboard to the mirror fairing. That looks good. And then, additionally, we have got uh, a decal here on the uh, outboard side of this turning vane. And what does that say, pray tell? It says, thank you, Charlie. I know we can't quite focus on it right now, but it says, thank you, Charlie. And uh, Charlie, in this case, is Charlie Whiting, who tragically died right before the season opening Australian Grand Prix. So that would have been a little livery addition that Ferrari put on as a tribute to Charlie Whiting, who was, of course, the uh, FIA race director for Formula One and uh, one of the chief technical delegates for Formula One as well for many years. And uh, the uh, Formula One community was absolutely shocked by that news on the eve of the Australian Grand Prix. And uh, obviously, Ferrari thought it appropriate to put a little bit of a tribute on the car for him. Across the flanks of the car now, towards the midsection, there's where we can start to see the effects of that matte paint. Looks really, really nice, and uh, again, at close range with bright spotlight on it, still looks fine. Those really uh, stark reflections just basically don't exist on it because of the matte finish, but it looks really good. And you can see, though, by the nature of the reflections that the surface, despite being a matte finish, is pretty much flawless. Looks tremendous. Outboard a little bit, though, and zooming out you can see that the car has a very significant amount of rake on it. And again, by rake, we mean that the front ride height is substantially lower than the rear ride height, and that's not an optical illusion here. The camera is more or less level. So you can see how the overall body line of the car basically slopes down toward the ground from aft to forward. And uh, obviously they're doing this for an aerodynamic gain. Again, they are trying to create an aerodynamic seal from the edge of the reference plane here and the ground because they're not allowed to seal that with skirts or anything like that. So in an attempt to claw back downforce via a crude ground effect, they uh, run a lot of rake to give the air an expansion zone through the rear end and then they try to seal it with vortex generators and the barge boards and turning vanes aerodynamically to run vortices along the edge of the reference plane attempting to seal the floor with aerodynamic effects. Not the most uh, effective solution but it's what they can do given the regulations. Going back to the rear end of the car now with our wheel and tires first of all on the rear end there it is, the Pirelli tire, and then our rear wheels, which are a bit more inset in terms of the uh, center hub of the wheel, simply because the uh, rear tires are bigger, 
but you can see that same sidewall lettering is evident here on the rear of the car as it is on the front looks absolutely tremendous and of course the tires say the same thing in that embossed lettering also the uh, sidewall lettering Pirelli P0 in white looks very nice as well and then moving to the extreme rear of the car with the rear wing end fence there it is all of the little streaks and gills and everything else that you can see on this car looks marvelous most of the structural forces on the wing actually transmitted just through the forward section leaving all of this open to be uh, bifurcated and split how many different ways to try and coax air around the end fences as well as to try and give a little bit of bleed air between the uh, gearbox casing down here and the center section of the wing where uh, most of the air actually passes through trying to create all of that downforce so it looks really really nice moving back toward the center section of the car here from profile there's the cockpit area there is the helmet of Charles Leclerc and you can see the halo detail as well here on SF90 it looks really really nice and uh, you can even see in the model anyway where halo is attached here both uh, laterally on both sides and the uh, central post as well. Not removable or anything, but it is there. Looks marvelous. Absolutely marvelous. Now look at the rear zone on SF90 coming in here. This is where a lot of the uh, aerodynamic evolution in Formula One has concentrated in recent years, and uh, it's no exception here on these 2019 cars. We did take a look at the 2019 Alfa Romeo C38 a couple of months ago, and it's a very similar picture here on the SF90 Ferrari, obviously this another 2019 car. So very similar story, but first of all, what dominates the rear end is obviously the trailing edge of the rear wing. That looks really nice. Your main plane and your slide gap and your DRS flap. Also a, a note on the uh, rear wing on this model. The other BBR Ferraris that I have, the SF70H and the SF71H, they have working DRS, but not this one. The DRS is fixed. It looks like it could pivot, and uh, the upper flap is secured on what appear to be hinge joints here, so it looks like it could pivot, but there's a little strut here on the uh, DRS actuation pod that actually locks it in place. I'm not entirely sure why they did that, and there's no notice uh, inside the box for this model saying operable DRS, operate carefully. So evidently, it's a feature that uh, they took away from these models. I'm not entirely sure why. I thought it was cool to be able to ma manipulate the DRS, but we can't on this one, which is a little bit sad. Otherwise, though, everything still looks absolutely wonderful. Moving in toward the center section, all of this in here is where the air is being funneled through at ridiculous velocity to create more downforce. Back here you can see the vestigial T-wing that uh, used to be on top of the shark fin there heading toward the main plane of the rear wing for 2017 when they had the shark fins, but when they knocked the shark fins down, they moved the T-wings down as well, basically to the only other place where they can legally put them. Also, we can see our exhaust outlets for the 1.6 liter V6. They there's our primary exhaust for the engine and then our wastegate exhaust, just a single pipe on top. Looks pretty good to me. Additionally, we can see the wishbones for the rear suspension at about this point each side. That looks good. The upper wishbones and then the pole rods will be coming in from down low um, around this height. So again, you got the pole rods and then the wishbones as well. Rear crash structure and the rain light, there we go. The little fin on top of the rear crash structure, obviously trying to get the exhaust to blow that a little bit to energize some of the flow through the main structure of the rear wing. Our rain light there, and then as we go a little bit lower, you can see the diffuser detail here. Rear wing end fences, of course, basically creating the upper level of the diffuser through the extreme rear zone of the car. But then we have got our diffuser tunnels here, one on each side, there is the legality plank, the absolute bottom of the car in the step plane area, as a vertical side. And then of course we have got our multiple layers of diffuser. These little areas on the diffuser, they are separate layers, but they're very, very thin. And what they're trying to do with these is they're just attempting to funnel the air through this level of the diffuser at extreme velocity in an attempt to energize more and more flow. And you can even see down the center here, we've got slightly larger gaps attempting to energize that flow. It looks really cool. Not nearly as complex as the, uh, the uh, multi-level diffusers or even the uh, blown diffusers that we had in the V8 era, but still it looks really good with the diffusers being a little bit wider due to the cars being a little bit wider, they are just as effective if not more so. 
the rear side of the rear brake ducts, you can see these little flaps and winglets in there just attempting to create more downforce at the wheels themselves. That all looks prim and proper and very nice. And just overall, the uh, overall proportion of the rear, it looks very, very good, I must say. No complaints from me. Taking a look at the left-hand side of the car just for continuity's sake. Really nothing different on the left-hand side as there is on the right-hand side, but just to show you what is evident here, looks very, very good, I must say. There's your front wing again and your front axle, the barge boards, and then your turning vanes along the midline, and then the uh, lateral edge of the floor in the reference plane area, and then moving rearward toward the rear wing. Looks really, really tremendous. Moving up a little bit, get an upper profile view on all of this. Looks good. There's our engine cover with the vestigial shark fin running the entire length of it. The uh, T-wing there for the camera mount. And then the cockpit area with the halo. All that looks really, really good. I will point out one detail here on the engine cover you can see the vestigial shark fin how it comes across here laterally um, longitudinally rather from fore to aft later on in the season ferrari opened up a little duct right in this section which uh, basically split the shark fin into two principal sections longitudinally they did not run that for the australian grand prix and this model of course being based on the version of the car that we saw in australia does not feature that either eventually they ended up with uh, a shark fin profile that more so resembled the airbox on the alfa romeo cars but uh, that was not on the car for australia therefore it is not on this model but looks really really good nonetheless very much like what we see thus far on the sf90 Taking the camera up freehand now, a little bit of a different camera this time around to show you some close-up shots on the car. First of all, the front wing as we can see it here. Not entirely sure if our focal length is going to be great on this, but you can start to see the front wing detail in terms of the different flap elements that we have going on. Looks absolutely wonderful, I must say. No complaints from me. And you can see the uh, different little structural bracing in there with our flap adjusters looks good as do uh, the profiles of the different flaps there represented anyway not entirely rendered in terms of being separate elements but it's there also you can see the uh, overall delta profile of the front wing is raked back a little bit that's also homologated in the regulations looks good and our decal work in there as well fia action for road safety and the like looks good and then of course the opposite side of the wing looks really really nice as well no complaints from me it looks wonderful also around the uh, nose section of the car you can see what we have going on you can see these little gills cut into the pylons that the front wing is mounted to and uh, that's something that actually is reminiscent of what mclaren were running back in 2017 on their car ferrari of course incorporating a feature like that onto their 2019 machine looks good to me both sides of that looks marvelous the nose tip proper you can see that there is a minuscule little duct cut into the very tip of the nose just trying to get cooling air through the nose structure through the cockpit and then of course we have got our wonderful decals across the nose section of the car and there is the number 16 for Charles Leclerc and uh, notice, if you look very closely on that number 16, we've got ourselves a little bit of a red border to the extreme top edge of the numbers. Initially, you may be inclined to say that that's a mistake, but no, that is actually a little incorporation of the national colors of Monaco in those numbers. Of course, Charles Leclerc being Monegasque, he's uh, representing the Monegasque flag colors with his number. So that red border across the top of the one and the six is actually an homage to the flag of Monaco. Moving toward the uh, middle section of the front end anyway, where the suspension pickup points are, you can see that we have got these little bolt hole details going on through here. We also have an outlet for the S-duct running through the nose section. That's uh, what the little raised fairing area is. Looks marvelous. No complaints in my book. Looks absolutely splendid. And then moving toward the center section of the car. Looking wonderful, prim and proper. We uh, move forward a little bit more, you can start to see 
all of that detail looks good. It looks very, very, very good across the whole top section of the monocoque. You can see that uh, circular black section there just in the middle and below the Wei Chai logo. That is the uh, 360 degree camera that all the Formula One cars run mandatorily these days. So looks really, really good. And uh, again, no real complaints in my book so far. Also, you can see 90 years Ferrari right there. So that's uh, again, an homage to Ferrari's 90th anniversary as an organization as well as the uh, car's namesake, SF90. Looks good. Continuing to take a look at the front midsection of the car, there's our barge board detail, as you can see. So very, very complex in terms of the multiple levels of the barge board with the different surfaces. They're all very jagged and uh, obtuse angles in many cases here in terms of the different panels and different elements of the barge board, but there they are. You can see that uh, one metallic stay there linking up to separate panels of barge board, just giving some more structural rigidity. Not at all dissimilar from the uh, little braces that you see here on the front wing. Basically, same idea linking two disparate panels together to function as one structural unit. Looks good. You can see the decal there at 90 years, and then the Ferrari Scudetto shield looks very good. And then, of course, getting toward our radiator inlets and our mirror fairings there, the stock supporting them. And then there's the uh, the cockpit detail there with our hashtag Essere Ferrari. That is uh, Italian for to be Ferrari, basically. Anyway, there's our main Scudetto shield there, Ferrari logo. More sponsorship graphics. Looking very, very nice. And of course there we have got ourselves our legality things in terms of our neutral button for the marshals as well as our status light for the curves on the car. Looks good. Also, to point this out, there's our uh, S-duct outlet and our vanity panel there covering uh, steps in the monocoque in terms of where the front end of the monocoque is. And you can see these wonderful screw head and bolt hole details around the front suspension pickup points. Looks absolutely marvelous. Loving all of that. No complaints at all in those departments. Radiator inlets on the car. There they are. Very, very narrow but looking wonderful. No radiator matrix is visible in there, but I'm led to believe that if you were to look at this car in reality, you wouldn't see that either. It would be a very, very inset component, the radiator there. But you can see how they're funneling air into the sides of these cars these days. There's the upper duct that we first saw in 2017 on the SF70, and uh, again on the SF71, and they carried that over into the SF90 for 2019, but much larger than it was on the 70 or 71. Very cool. And then there's Halo from the front. Looks good. You can see the central stay there looking toward the driver's area, looking fine. And then our air inlet snorkel with the little vein bifurcating it into two halves. Looks good. Looks very, very good. Awesome. Absolutely awesome levels of detail. There's our T-Wing on top of the roll hoop with our onboard cameras. Our little triangle there, the high voltage triangle because of the... Uh, Curves on board and the high voltage battery pack and would also be on board the car below the fuel tank cockpit surround area of the halo pickup points our lifting bar there it's just an open section in the uh, roll bar that would uh, allow a lifting bar or uh, a rope to be passed through it should the car need to be lifted up there is the little red e for our emergency kill switch little shell logo another camera mount and then of course we have got Charles Leclerc's name there. Looks real, real good. Like all of that. On the flanks of the car, there's the turning vein again. There is a better look at the Thank You Charlie decal on the turning vein. Looks marvelous. And then toward the uh, floor area, flanks of the side pods. And then moving toward the diffuser, where we can see, additionally, we have our suspension uh, pull rods visible through there, going to the bottom of the gearbox casing, where the dampers would be mounted. We've got these little enclosed holes across the tire squirt area there, just controlling the uh, air that comes into contact with that uh, area of the car. The uh, upper surface of the floor, a little stay there, visible just to brace the floor to the uh, chassis a little bit better. And then you can see all of this space to play with moving toward the top side of the diffuser. The more air you can ram in through there, the more downforce theoretically you can create. Looks absolutely wonderful. Side of the engine cover with Charles Leclerc's number 16 again, T-wing detail, and then our rear wing 
There is the upper side of the rear wing with our DRS actuator pod there. And you can see the linkage is going to the flap. It is that central linkage, though, that you can see just intersecting the middle of the zero in 90 years there. You can see that. That is what's keeping that wing from being able to pivot fore and aft to open and close the DRS. Not sure why BBR did that, but uh, that's why we don't have operable DRS. The two swan neck supports for the rear wing, they are more so supporting the wing from above rather than below. You can see how the forces would be distributed through the swan necks there, and then uh, they'd be transmitted down into the rear crash structure. Looks good. Exhaust pipes there. Marvelous. Absolutely marvelous. The uh, wishbones passing through the bodywork in this section, and then a wonderful look at the very nice paint on this car. Looks wonderful. No complaints from me on anything with this one. It's, it's another fine example of BBR craftsmanship. Looking into the cockpit on SF90, there is the steering wheel on this thing. It looks absolutely amazing. We do not have operable steering on this model, but we do have some incredible detailing on the steering wheel. Take a look. I'm not sure for how much longer our focus is going to hold here the closer I zoom in, but yep, there's the limit. You can see, though, that basically every switch is labeled on that steering wheel. There's legible text. The colors look good. You can see the uh, green neutral button on the upper left and the red uh, pit lane speed limiter button on the right. We've got shift lights. We have got status lights for flag signals and things like that. And then you can see that the rotary switches there are labeled. It looks amazing. Absolutely remarkable that they're able to get this level of detail in with these models. And it's been like this uh, on the BBR models for uh, all of the ones that I've got going back to the 70H. Looks wonderful. Also, you can see the uh, top section of Halo done with that carbon look texture. It looks good. And then, of course, getting into Charles Leclerc's helmet there. Wonderfully detailed. I must say, no complaints at all. Looks great. The graphics, even on the helmet, as small as it is, they're crisp and clean and clear and entirely legible. Looks good. Getting toward the uh, front of the cockpit behind the steering wheel, you can see the quick release collar there has been modeled. Looks good. Unfortunately, we can't really get directly above the uh, steering wheel because of where Halo is, but got all of that. Additionally, we have got our seat belts in here. All molded plastic parts, I'm led to believe, but the seat belts look good enough. You can see that they um, are textured. Looks good. Coming along the side of the cockpit. There's the cockpit surround. I cannot see if we have any uh, decals along the side of the cockpit in terms of a chassis plate or homologation sticker. I do not believe that they're there, but if they are there, it's uh, almost impossible to see them anyway because of how Halo comes in through the cockpit. But uh, what is evident here is absolutely wonderful. They did not really spare any effort in this department. Looks great. Absolutely 100% great. No complaints from me in terms of the cockpit detailing. And then of course just pulling out, looking at the flanks of the car here. Again, that paint looks so very, very nice. Yes, it does. I'm getting through the rear wings geometries here with the end fences. So stark and so jagged are these geometries, but they really did a job on all of it. There's your rear tire. It looks great. Rear crash structure and diffuser, exhaust. Looks wonderful. It looks absolutely wonderful, all of it. Can we get a look at the uh, tire lettering on here? If we took a look at this before, but can we get any closer? Maybe. There it is. Pirelli, made in Italy. Tire for competition use only. Looks really, really good. Specifications there on the tire, visible. Looks absolutely ridiculous in terms of the detailing in there. And also you can see that we even have our nozzle there, our little valve for uh, for changing the tire pressure and obviously filling and emptying. Looks very, very good. Very, very good indeed. Solid 10 out of 10 BBR. Tremendous job. I've seen uh, a couple reviews of this so far on YouTube, but uh, really, uh, you got to take a very close look at this. If you're in the market, definitely uh, the, nobody makes a better Ferrari Formula One model these days. 
It just is absolutely sublime. And lastly, something I've been remiss in doing in the last couple of reviews, the underside here of SF90. You can see what we have going on. Pretty much par for the course in terms of the details that you would expect to see, but at the same time, they are the details that are here. Here we can see the front wing underside. Basically, it looks like a mirror image of the top side, but uh, you can see that we've got the little strakes there for our vortex generators. Looks good. You can also see where the wing is fixed to the nose. There's the underside of the nose. That channel is created by the pylons. Looks good. And then through the center section of the nose. Wonderful. There's our tongue tea tray area and our barge boards off on either side. So complicated the geometries in this section, but it looks absolutely wonderful. There it is, 118, made in China. And then we get into the reference plane area with the carbon look. There's the BBR logo. And below that, Ferrari SF90. And you can see the little strakes and louvers cut into the sides of the floor. Looking good. There's our legality plank. Look at wonderful running for aft. Then the bottom side of our diffuser, looking very, very nice. Absolutely wonderful, everything here. Top side, bottom side, inside, outside, a wonderful model. So there it was in 118th scale, the Ferrari SF90 rendered by BBR. An absolutely exquisite model here for not such exquisite prices. Again, about $300 US will get you this one. And considering the amount of labor that goes into creating something like this to render all those really fine details, particularly the aerodynamic details with the barge boards and the front wing with the flap adjusters and the little braces that go between the individual flap elements, to be able to render all of that competently and to make it look convincing as they've done here, really, to to have something like this cost $300, okay, it's still not, it, it's not inexpensive, but it's certainly not on the level of the $800 amalgam bottles that we talked about at the beginning, and certainly the sky is the limit in terms of what you could pay for something that you would commission privately. But for what this is, for being something that's reasonably mass produced, they have done an absolutely incredible job. And again, the really defining feature of this car for me, because of the radical departure that it was as far as Ferrari were concerned, it's the matte paint. I think it looks absolutely wonderful. There were some people in the real world when Ferrari unveiled their livery for 2019 who said, no, I don't like this. It doesn't look like a Ferrari. It does look like a Ferrari, and it looks absolutely wonderful here in the flesh albeit in 118th scale. So really, hats off to BBR. They have absolutely done an incredible job and very, very pleased I am with this one. It looks very nice next to the SF70 and SF71H from 2017 and 2018. So wonderful trifecta of late 2010s Ferrari models by BBR and Really, it looks wonderful. The car itself, it probably will not be one of the more famous Ferraris moving into history, but for me, it definitely cemented Charles Leclerc as somebody absolutely deserving of the Ferrari drive. He's got the performance to back up the prestige of driving for Scuderia Ferrari. He's really, really going to be a force to be reckoned with moving forward into the 2020s. But here in 2019, he joined the team and he took two victories at two difficult weekends for him personally and just difficult weekends in terms of what was demanded of him in terms of being able to defend his position in the races and take those victories. But Spa and Monza, two absolute classic venues. He took his two first Formula One victories at them on consecutive outings. So, yes, this car is more about Charles Leclerc, for me anyway, than it is about Ferrari. But here it is, the SF90 in 118th scale by BBR, a wonderful model. If you're in the market for contemporary Formula One cars, particularly Ferraris, definitely give this one a long look. It's wonderful. Until next time, though, I do hope that all of you have enjoyed this one. Ferrari Man 601 saying thank you very much for watching, and of course, we will see you soon.